So, uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Oxford. Apologies that we are a few minutes late starting this uh, webinar. We just had a, a last minute technical hitch on a, on, on, on a laptop. So, uh, apologies for that. Uh, but we are here today with uh, our latest uh, webinar in the the, the the real estate series from the Science Business School. So really kind of uh, with uh, Professor Andrew Ball, uh, and then we have two guest speakers today, uh, Akim Yadelski from uh, Fibre, uh, and Thomas Herr, who is uh, uh, the head of digital innovation at CBRE for uh, EMEA. So the future of real estate initiative at the SAI Business School uh, is an initiative uh, with several industry partners. Uh, we are putting out uh, a number of, of research reports uh, each, each year. Uh, the latest one is all around tokenization, uh, the, the future of, of real estate investment to uh, discuss the, the current state of, uh, of where we are with, with tokenization and how that might be applied and where that might go to next uh, in particular application to real estate. Uh, a couple of housekeeping points. So we expect this webinar to go go for uh, about 30 minutes in terms of conversation between uh, Professor Baum and the, the, the two guests. Uh, as we go through, please feel free to uh, enter any questions which you have. There is a question panel in the uh, webinar platform in front of you. So uh, please enter those and then we can address those to the speakers uh, at, at, at the end. Uh, and also just to say also that uh, this uh, webinar also supports our executive education program, uh, the Oxford Real Estate Program, which is coming up in two months' time. Uh, we have uh, a few final places uh, remaining on that. Uh, if you are interested in, in coming, we uh, uh, encourage you to apply by, by the end of this month to take one of those last few, few places. Uh, but really, from there, I think we should uh, move on. So I will introduce Andrew, uh, who can go on to our guest speakers. Andrew. Thank you very much, Steve. So um, with us today, we have Akim and Thomas, uh, with whom um, I worked on, on developing this report on tokenization. And I think where we should start is perhaps ask Akim about Fibre and, and your work with them, Akim, and what Fibre is there to do and talk about blockchain. And then Thomas will move on to you and talk about what it is you do at CBRE. So, Akim, what, what is it that Fibre was set up to do? Uh, so, could you quickly repeat the last question? Uh, it wasn't faded out a bit. Okay. What, is it, what, is it that, what is it that led to the foundation of Fibre? Yes. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah. Fibre uh, is it still kind of a young uh, foundation. We were founded one and a half years ago. Um, from eight uh, co-founders from eight different countries in Europe. And the idea behind Fabry was to bring kind of the lo local knowledge we already aggregated um, in, in our, diff our own countries together in an international organization and to help others as well to, to kind of spread the news about uh, the use of blockchain in real estate. And so meanwhile, Fabry is um, active in 30 countries um, uh, with about 50, more than 50 locations. And so we're continuing to do that based on like our meetup network and then built on that we, we have like um, like create papers, um, uh, an annual um, Fibre report in order to kind of capture what's going on in the, the real estate uh, blockchain scene worldwide. Great. I mean, in, in, um, in five years time, what, what do you think the main areas of application of blockchain will be in the real estate industry? I think, honest to be honest, I think we will not talk about blockchain so much anymore. Um, I think this is, this process already started. So you talk more about the use cases that are powered by blockchain. And yeah. um, I think we got like this blockchain hype like two, three years ago. Um, there was a peak of it. And um, I think this, in a way, this didn't really help like really to, to um, get in contact with the technology because the expectation was too high and then the frustration uh, afterwards as well. And yeah. I think currently we're more into this application area. So people who are still working with blockchain, they do it on a serious level, more like more quiet, more focused um, and uh, in search for like the, the, the clear value you're providing with that. And I think this is part of a kind of larger transformation process. Um, we, we're currently still in this platform economy 
where a few players really do, um, are dominating um, the, the the internet. And I think with the help of blockchain, we can kind of more democratize, democratize this and um, kind of involve more players in the process and create more transpar transparency and um, kind of as well give back more control to uh, the users of, of data. So, so what, what would a typical use case be for, for, for blockchain in, in real estate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, the obviously like about the, the most um, kind of interesting or the, the hottest one you just published the paper about, like it's tokenization. It's like the use of tokens um, in different ways. Like, and I think the first way is kind of in order to, to share value, um, the, the value that is connected with real estate. I think there we see currently the most uh, activity. There, there are many startups all over the globe um, looking into this. And uh, so I think this is probably the part where we see the most um, development over the next couple of months and years. I think f as well interesting is kind of anything which is um, connected to um, like contracts, kind of um, making deals like um, their blockchain can just be more like kind of more, um, more transparent way in um, kind of forming agreements, kind of uh, helping kind of different parties to come to an agreement. And I think as well in, the, in connection with the whole IoT um, topic, um, if, you, if you think about like um, like that smart contracts are helping uh, IoT devices to make contracts about like sharing energy, um, selling energy, uh, selling da data or sharing data um, without like humans being really involved in that and the human then themselves only kind of um, set the overall parameters in order to, um, to get what they actually want in the end. Great, thank you for that, Thomas. We're, we're all busy people. I know. I know you're a busy person. What What is it about tokenization that made you sufficiently interested to spend time on developing this report with us? Uh, yeah, thank you, Andrew, for having me here. Um, I am representing a group in CBIE which is dealing with digital innovation in general. So we are looking into all kinds of promising technologies to help uh, develop uh, the tech savviness of our industry. And among them, a blockchain plays a special role because currently we uh, focus more on, on data um, issues, on business intelligence, on machine learning stuff and on IoT. But blockchain is earmarked as a technology with a big focus and this is uh, leading us to the point to support this kind of research and also to support Fibri. And um, in this specific case with tokenization, I mean, CBAE is uh, is kind of a by nature a, 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 um, a transaction company. So basically, we help to transact real estate, uh, be it on the capital markets or agency side. And uh, we see a lot of value, as as Achim already mentioned, in especially in this deal making and transaction um, management side of, of of the business. And tokenization is something which is uh, quite promising in this field. There's a lot of expectation. You mentioned, Achim, this democratization of the investment process. Uh, currently, we do not really see use cases or kind of valid use cases in this field. But what we already start to see is that tokenization brings a, a lot of efficiency to a fund management process, etc. So we have a very practical approach here to see where can we uh, create more efficiencies in the transactions and the second one is are there new is, is, is this is this a genesis of a new kind of asset class uh, with the security tokens so we're looking into it and from a very practical standpoint we also do experiments and pilots with our clients on the utility tokenization um, level so for example with Deloitte in in Amsterdam we are currently running a uh, on blockchain like the management of the coffee machines that might sound funny but uh, it's basically a way to to test how in in real life you can use uh, blockchain to e to ease um, uh, facilities management processes okay that's great thank you we go on to the slides now and um, and just pick out the sort of the key the key issues in the in the in the presentation for a couple of uh, news items last week which uh, were incredibly timely the first one was that a, a new property stock exchange based in London IPSX had put its first building on its platform the intention being to sell shares in the building 
So this is an example of fractionalization, splitting a building into small pieces. And I think um, CBRE would be interested in this. The market is very interested in whether this is the, the start of a new way of trading uh, investments in buildings. So we start off with the idea that property is illiquid and, and lumpy, comes in large lock sizes. Can we split it into small pieces, make it more quickly and, and build the market for it? So that was the first announcement last week. And then also last week, we heard that the company called Brickmark, based in uh, Switzerland, had agreed to buy a building from a well-known uh, property company called RFR Holding. Um, and they were going to pay them in tokens, in, in Brickmark tokens. And I think that, that is, that's fractionalization, but it's also then pushing further then using blockchain and tokens. Uh, so it's pushing it slightly further into what I'd call tokenization. So this report deals with fractionalization in all its forms and then particularly focuses on tokenization, the digital expression of, of this area. So the, dr the dream is, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could split a building into smaller pieces that anybody can trade with a thousand pounds or a thousand euros and why not trade that thousand pounds for eleven hundred pounds instantly for a tiny fee on your phone two years later and that's the fundamental promise of tokenization which we define as representing fractional ownership interest in an asset with blockchain based tokens now the um the the, the next one yeah so here's the, here's a picture of the building that's on the ipsx platform this is this is a fractionalized asset. One thing that we need to say, I think, about this report is it's quite difficult to generalize about all legal systems in the world and all regulatory processes to do with blockchain, to do with property transactions. Laws vary. And so there are, there are a few generalizations stated here about law and finance that may not apply in every country. So one of the issues is going to be about regulatory arbitrage, you know, some countries making things easier than others. And so places like Liechtenstein and um, Luxembourg and Singapore are making, making it easier to, to do this sort of thing. But we end up with the fundamental legal question about whether you can split a building into lots of pieces legally. And we, we need to move on and consider that issue. Uh, the sort of uh, things we're talking about in the report then is, is the background to fractionalization, which is probably crowdfunding in the fintech world. Talk about different ways of splitting assets up into pieces, then moving on to the, the digital fractionalization or, or tokenization idea. Uh, the regulation of it, what the valuation issues are, and then examples of deals that we collected between us, between the three of us, between Fibri, Oxford and CBRE, we collected data on as many transactions using tokens as we possibly could, and then we go on to look at the future. Now, the, 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 the use case is that, you know, as I said before, property is illiquid, it's lumpy. Can we fractionalize assets? And then can we make this, um, this trading and splitting of assets efficient through using digital technology, including blockchain? And it has to be said that not everybody is going to see this as a great thing. A lot of people will, but not all market participants see improved liquidity as a great thing in the property market. Um, an illiquid asset, a private asset that isn't easily traded, should deliver a higher return, and it probably suits quite a lot of people to make that, that asset non-democratized. And, and it has to be said that non-digital fractionalization, which you could say is crowdfunding is the best example, that hasn't been a, an exactly a runaway success. There has been a, a build-up in the number of crowdfunding deals, but you know, we've, we only see that as funding something like 0.1% of all capital raised in Europe in the last three years. So it's not been a huge success yet. So the question is whether this IPSX platform or whether digital fractionalization will, will kick the market into a, new, into a new phase. As we can see here, the, the sort of crowdfunding market was about 250 million euros of transactions over the last three years, which is, which is okay, but it's not, it's not a huge dent. So in the existing world, as far as we can generalize it, we can, we can split a building up in different ways. We can split between, in the UK, we can split between four people. In Belgium, there's no limit. In Belgium and France, there's no limit. But as soon as we split the, a building between lots of different people, the question that arises then is who is in control? What happens if you need to spend money on the building? What happens if, you, if you, somebody wants to sell the building? All of those things need to be uh, mediated, contracted, agreed, and that means that you're 
you're then into legal documentation, which you can't avoid. Uh, we can subdivide buildings physically up to a limit. We can do timeshares. We can create leasehold interests. We can sell tranches of income. We can syndicate. Now, if we get into syndication as an example, this is a, an idea that the four people in this room, uh, plus Thomas and Akeem, could together buy a share in a building. Um, we wouldn't be able to split the ownership of that building freehold, and we wouldn't want to either, because we'd want to know who's in control. And so syndication will naturally lead on to some concept of a partnership. There will be an intermediate legal entity, probably a partnership. One of us will be the general partner. The other five will be, will be limited partners. The general partner is responsible for the decision making. He's responsible for making sure that we've got enough money to refurbish the building. And he will decide how we sell the building and how, how many people we need to agree. There'll be majority rights and so on. So all of that stuff is needed to make fractionalization work and um we we need to either these fractionalized things are already permitted by land law or they're always going to need some sort of intermediate structure now ipsx off its first property for sale last week we don't yet know whether that's going to be a success and the history of attempts to do this sort of thing in the past have not been successful so this is quite a big step what makes people really excited about fractionalization is the fact that it's starting to happen in assets like fine art, racehorses, vineyards. You know, the, the, it is possible to own a share in an Andy Warhol building traded by um, a platform called Masterworks in New York. So you can buy your $1,000 share in an Andy Warhol painting. I don't think it will give you any right to hang the, build, hang the painting in your house. Um, it's pretty simple because there's no income thrown off from the painting and neither does it need much expenditure. You know, it's pretty easy to maintain. So somebody will be curating that asset probably in a, in a museum somewhere and the pride of ownership is probably what you get for your thousand dollars and a bit of capital appreciation maybe. Now, why not split property up in that way? Well, as we've already said, problems of refurbishment, expenditure, control and so on start to, start to arise. But also what arises is the use of the building. And as Thomas said, utility tokens starts to look quite interesting. So if we move into digital fractionalization and tokenization, we should think about two different sorts of tokens. One, a utility token, which, is, which gives you the right to use a building. We, in getting into this building today, I used a utility token. I've got a digital building pass. It opens the door for me. I can also buy coffee and food on my digital token. And it's pretty easy to think about how you'd expand that to the use of meeting rooms, the use of energy, um, and those, that sort of utility token is, is going to have quite a lot of transactions attached to it. So if you look at a building with uh, 22 Bishopsgate, got 12,000 occupiers. If those 12,000 occupiers do five transactions a day, that's 60,000 transactions on a utility token in one day in one building. Mm. So it's worth investing in that technology because it take a small slice of those transactions, there's a lot of revenue attached. However, a security token is a, is a sort of a, an investment asset. It'll be regulated by most financial um, conduct authorities. Um, and, and a security token will give you an entitlement to ownership of a building, which might trade very irregularly. You know, buildings sell once every five or six years. That's the, the initial problem. So the amount of velocity in the security token market is likely to be considerably less than in the utility token market. And we know from the discussion we've just had that tokenization will always require a, 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 an intermediate structure. So a security token will have to be issued by a regulated company, a partnership or a trust, which is in control of the asset. You can't simply split a building up into pieces. And so this idea of the intermediate structure illustrated by this picture here, that the, the house will be put into a limited liability company, let's say in the US, and that limited liability company will then issue, will then issue tokens holders of these security tokens and traded hopefully in the ideal world on some sort of exchange. Um, the case for fractionalization and for tokenization, we've, we've talked about it, it's all to do with lower cost, it's to do with uh, privacy, democratization, um, reducing the lot size of buildings, creating data transparency amongst the owners and so on. Um, but it requires quite a leap of faith, you know, in order to 
get to a successful digitalized token market for real estate, the first thing you've got to uh, prove is that there is a market for units and single assets. So is, is there a proven market for shares in that building in Birmingham that's on the IPSX platform? Do we know that lots of people want to buy thousand euro shares in buildings? It's not proven. You know, why shouldn't people buy into funds with diversified assets rather than one building? How does somebody decide which building they want to buy? So that's the first thing. Second thing is you need confidence in the platform. So the promoter of a tokenization um, issue in the real estate market might be an unknown Swiss startup that you, that you have to trust. And because blockchain is new, it's not associated with the big players. It's not associated with Heinz and Tishman Spire. It's associated with, with smaller startups. So that's a, a risk that people have to get over. Thirdly, you've got to believe that you understand blockchain technology or trust blockchain technology to work. And then fourthly, you've, you've got to go through the legal costs of transferring an asset into this corporate structure. You can't just split the building up into pieces. So all of those reasons mean that it's not simple. You can't click your fingers and, and move into this, this low stress, cheap, digitalized token world. A lot of market experts worry very much about the whole concept of fractionalization. The, the key issue being once I buy a share in a building, and I don't control that building, somebody else controls the building, what will the value of my unit be when I want to come to sell it? It might, might be very excited when I buy it, it might be a new building, what happens in three years time? If there's not much liquidity, not much market, I might have to sell at a significant discount to the, the price I paid. And a lot of the history of fractionalization of real estate points towards those discounts being in place. Now we don't know, it may not happen this time, but that's, the, that's where history um, tends to settle. So you come back to this question, is, it, is there enough effective demand to buy units in buildings to justify the expense of development and overcome the risk of an untried platform? That then takes us into um, the, we'll skip over the security, sorry, the, the regulation and valuation issues and come back to that in a minute, but it, it takes us to what, what has actually been happening so far. And this, this key problem that there's not a proven market for splitting up buildings into units, there is a market where there is a proven demand for splitting property assets up into pieces, and that's the property fund market. Now, in the property fund market, we already have um, a regulated entity, so the fund will be, will be managed by a regulated business. There's very little risk of having to invest in a startup you've never heard of because there are plenty of big names out there who, who issue funds. The funds are already fractionalized so you don't have to believe that people want fractions of funds everybody buys fractions of funds that's, that's what a fund is and then finally the intermediate legal structure will already be in place so there will already be a company a partnership or a trust so the the leap of faith to get you from where the fund market is today to a tokenized fund market is not big it's simply getting your head around blockchain and so the conclusion of the report, one conclusion of the report, is that the, the first step should be looking at the fund market and working hard to tokenize funds, because the risk of getting it wrong and launching something in an excited state without proven demand for it is much less in the fund market than is in the single asset market. In the FIBRI CBRE Oxford survey, we, we've, we've published data, data about 17 transactions. Nine of them were funds. One was debt, and there's, there's a strong case for fractionalizing or tokenizing debt. That's an, a pretty easy to think about how you split a contract up into small pieces. Um, seven of the deals were single assets. But when we dig into the nature of those deals and take an example of the Brickmark deal, which was announced last week, which is a single asset in Zurich, um, it's very clear that the manager intends this to be the first building in a fund. And uh, he, he was very skeptical about the idea of funds and talking to another company, BrickBlock, that they have the same, the same view. So I think there's a sort of a gathering consensus that, that funds are a good place to start in this idea of, of blockchain uh, enabled tokenization. And that to go straight to single buildings is a very risky jump into an untested market. Um, the work needed to justify the digitalization of data requires lots of velocity of transactions. And therefore, we need, we need evidence that there's going to be enough business coming out of the work that you do to launch a platform which makes utility tokens interesting. Um, the, the legal work that's already gone into creating funds makes fund tokenization interesting. 
Um, when we look at single assets, questions remain about whether there's going to be enough demand for the product to justify the development costs and the risks taken to jump into this reasonably unknown world. We conclude that the market for tokenizations, certainly in its very early stages, um, there are two different issues here. What, one is the, the concept of fractionalizing an asset and the, 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 the sort of strategic value of splitting the building into pieces. The other thing is the, is the pure cost efficiency of blockchain, which, is, which could reduce the admin costs of, of running funds, of primary capital raising, of secondary transactions. So we've got this sort of utopian idea about fractionalization, but we've got the purely pragmatic idea about can you reduce your admin costs by using blockchain? And there seems to be a strong use case for that. There are other things that could come out of tokenization. You know, buying a share in your local coffee shop might be something that you, you would like to do. It might not be a financial investment primarily. You might get a free cup of coffee and the pleasure of knowing that the coffee shop is part of yours. That's a sort of one way in which the utility tokenization market might go. And we're, we're a little skeptical that single asset tokenization will gather significant momentum quickly. So that we, we recommend this sort of um, this investment in funds as the way of getting this started and then see whether big buildings like the Empire State Building would justify. I mean, those buildings are already in, in funds, in REITs. So that's the next step. So I, I, that's a very quick run through. I, I wanted to just go back to Akim and to Thomas in case they had any any comeback on that while we look at any questions coming in from people on the call. So, Thomas, any any immediate reaction? Well, I found it in. Thank you, Andrew. I found it interesting to see that the findings of uh, the research we did together with uh, you guys and Fibri uh, kind of really gave, gave proof to our assumption that this is still a very kind of young and 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 and, and uh, small market. So, if you would put the uh, you know the numbers of tokenized assets in relation to the overall transaction volume in our markets, then you will see that it's even less than or much less than and then you know the the crowdfunding uh, examples of 0.1 to 0.25 percent market share you've mentioned so the question of course for a business uh, owner would always be is that already the right time to to, to uh, kind of consider this because you will definitely be one of the kind of early movers there and uh, as as one partner at Arabs once put it in a conference that in our industry everybody is uh, wants to be the second and everybody is afraid to be the first mover so um on the other hand what i what i found interesting and you mentioned uh, this example in your intro statement uh, there are kind of serious investors now considering this as an opportunity so you you had this brick mark experience and i might i would like to pick the peak side example where we talk about an institutional 200 million euro fund which is brought on blockchain, so people could argument this is just for marketing pur purposes. Uh, the the explanation is that it's exactly for making the fund administration easier. And that brings me to Achim's initial point that perhaps in 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 five years' time we will not really recognize the, the technology behind. We will simply see that there are means to make our um, uh, transactions easier, and and blockchain could be one of them. So I think we should not expect too much of it but we should also not neglect that there is something starting to get traction yeah 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 Great. i actually no, I, I agree with thomas as well and i think i think there will be some kind of action and um, things going on but it will not be very much visible because i think it's mostly happening right now on a corporate level that they corporates or even funds they they start like working with, with um the existing um kind of real estate um, to, to experiment with tokenization. And I think their goal is more like to, um, to streamline their own processes, to reduce their own costs, uh, and less to kind of use it as a marketing um, kind of um, um, like tool yeah. to uh, engage people in, in, in their funds because they're using blockchain. I think, um, and I think there you see as well, probably that's the easiest way to see the advantage of the technology. And um, we, we shouldn't forget that we, um, if you look at the whole real estate life cycle, like all this um, this fund management or like this um, tokenization is only one one piece of, of that. But you need the whole kind of life cycle in a digital format in order to to use it properly. Um, you mentioned regulations earlier and things like that. And and I think it's there's so much still to do on on the kind of digital 
digitalization of the real estate uh, industry. Um, and so therefore it's in, in, in that term still too early to really fully use blockchain functionality um, on top of that. So I think it will be something that uh, starts already. It will go on and will, be, will grow bigger, but we will see the full effects only once like the whole digitalization is really working and everything else is kind of connecting to each other. I think that's a, that's a great point. I mean, there is there is evidence now, I think, isn't there, of, of people starting to use blockchain as, as the plumbing and engineering that sits underneath something. So the Peakside Fund with BrickBlock is a good example of that, where the use case was 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 about reducing the administration costs and and giving access to a bigger market. Um, so if we look at the economics of capital raising, if you try and launch, go and raise money for a fund, it's incredibly expensive. Um, one, one fund manager we interviewed uh, said that in raising $900 million for his European property fund number four, he, he had 497 meetings, including 20 trips to Korea. The, 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 this is just unsustainable. You, you cannot do this as a fund management business and you need to find efficient ways of, of reaching out. So if, if the plumbing underneath funds moves to to blockchain because it's cheaper as a way of maintaining an investor registry and a way of, of then facilitating a transfer of units between existing investors in funds. And then we move to a world where somebody creates a platform where all funds contribute and, and share becomes a marketplace. Then, then we can see that blockchain becomes the plumbing underneath the entire fund industry. And then you might find that bigger buildings become plumbed into the same system and, and then off we, off we go. Um, we're getting quite a few interesting questions coming in. Um, uh, what is the biggest reason that, that funds jump from Excel to blockchain? And I think it's, it's got to be it's got to be cost reduction and um, and, and efficiency of processing. Uh, what about what about you, Akim? And what, why what is the biggest reason for for somebody to jump from, from traditional Excel technology into into a blockchain system? Um. Well, I think. I'm, I mean, as I said, I think. Data. I think uh, there's there's a step in between that. Um, for, I think that's a very good example because um, I, I, for example, I talk to to well, banks as well, who have a large real estate portfolio, but they're not really in, so much often in, in real estate. And so they they approached um, me. I like to ask asking, uh, how could we uh, tokenize that? But by looking at that, you actually figure out that the whole kind of um, property management process is if if at all based on Excel, and so um, actually before you ac uh, can actually start thinking and, and working on the tokenization, you need to kind of get the whole thing, um, the whole kind of management process and property management process digital, and um, then build on that you can think about like tokenizing something. But that's exactly what I, what I said earlier. So there's so many issues are still still going on, and it was kind of covered up for a long time because. There's enough money going around, and so you just put some people on it in order to fix an issue, but it's not really going away. And I think that is something where we need to really kind of focus on. And um, but to come back to that question, so in a way, I think obviously you can still experiment on a blockchain layer, like. Um, but I I think it's too early for companies who still run things on Excel to say, well, we fully move towards blockchain. I think it's maybe a good. It's a, I think it's always a balance between like having a vision where you want to go and um, where you actually are currently and um, what you want to do and where you earn your money as well. And I think to do both, is, it's a good idea. And um, to have like this innovation kind of go, coming back to your daily business, but still have like this operational kind of um, needs um, uh, in your mind when you think about something like blockchain. So we, we, uh, we were, Magnus pointed out that it was only half his question. I think the other, the other part of his question was why not just into a traditional or not a traditional but a digital database solution rather than yeah. go to blockchain so that's a yeah so we see people working in parallel don't we in digital databases and thinking about blockchain in parallel with that yeah definitely um, i think you need to build on that yeah okay uh, do you need additional regulatory approval to tokenize a traditional real estate fund or pe fund um the the, the secure if you issue security tokens they will be regulated as securities um, so I think the answer is no. You, you, you jump straight into the into the regulated world anyway by jumping into security token. Okay, so a couple more questions. We've had one uh, here. So 
Uh, people have been talking about tokenizing real estate for a long time now. Uh, maybe Thomas, this is one for you. Uh, what has to happen or what functionality needs to be in place to see true, uh, true momentum in uh, real estate tokenization? Um, well, the easy answer would be it needs to have a clear USP. So do we really attract new customers? So do we really ex extend the volume of, um, of investable money for certain assets uh, by, uh, by new ways of, of fractionalization? It? I mean, if you only substitute investment in funds with, subs with the investment in tokens, uh, then uh, there is, uh, you know, this is of lesser interest for, for the uh, investment managers. Uh, secondly, uh, can we really save money in administrating um, um, uh, the funds or, or the, the, the assets, uh, which is one of the uh, aspects of this big side fund, for example, that they, they claim that they can reduce um, they reduce the um, uh, the ticket sizes from their typical size of 250k to 100k uh, euros. So that's still not democratized, but it's a significant more than 50% reduction of the ticket size, which is possible because the administration is easier. So that would be a, a thing there. And if there is a clear and proved USP, be it on the investment side or on the administration side, uh, then uh, I mean the the um, the market will adopt it. If there is no proven uh, benefit, then I think there is a stickiness of the market to the current uh, to the current situation. And then, I mean, there's a bit of an arbitrage play, what, what you mentioned, Andrew, in, in regards to regulation. So is it easier to invest in, 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 in real estate assets uh, uh, through tokenization? Um, this is, for example, something which I hear when, I, when I'm traveling through the Middle East and to, to, to other countries where uh, the markets are less regulated and these people are very much interested to invest in safe markets like the UK or, or, or Europe in general. And uh, for them, it would be an easy way to invest uh, if, uh, over a longer distance. This is your 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 thing, you know, about traveling to Korea like six times to sell your fund. However, one should be very careful in that regard, uh, with you know, not 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 promoting um, uh, 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 blood money here or any any kind of uh, 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 unlegal uh, transactions, uh, money laundering, etc. Uh, through this thing. Through, through, through the new technology. So I think it has benefits um, and in, in, in general, if there's a USP, uh, the market will adopt it over time, but it will not be kind of overnight. It will take, I would say, like five to 10 years that market use also uh, will change. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, over to you, uh, Akin, with, with, with the next question, if we can. So uh, Andrew asks, can the issue of who owns and manages not be solved by tokens with rights and contracts uh, functionality uh, is this possible already on some ethereum platforms for example yeah I think that that should be the goal I mean to to get there to um, basically um, to get all this kind of the, the rights you have and the accessibility and everything connected to the token and um, so make it make the process easier in, um, in, in how you access things and uh, how you um, who's allowed to access and, and all the regulations as well. So, I mean, I think uh, I think it's a huge, huge task to get that all done, but I, if you, in, in a way, get the, all the regulations kind of um, combined with a, with a token, um, you as well make it much easier to access a market. So, because you do, you're not, today you need to have a, a local lawyer and, and, and real estate agent in order to get something going if you're not used to that market. Um, if you have um, a token or like a tokenized real estate uh, where all this kind of is already um, solved within that um, kind of code in the token, then then you increase the access accessibility and as well make sure that it's uh, it's legally uh, right, uh, re legally okay to do that. And um, so that that should definitely be the goal to have all that combined. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So we're coming up on time here. So maybe uh, just uh, a kind of closing uh, remark each. Uh, for me, is there anything else that you would like to to add, to add uh, Thomas, at this point? 
Yes, I would uh, call for all the participants here if they are aware of uh, tokenizations which you don't find in the report, please get in touch with this group here to kind of contribute to a uh, kind of more comprehensive collection of, of, of examples. And uh, if you are really interested in blockchain, then you might consider collaborating with Fibri and supporting the organization. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Akim, any uh, final comments from you, please? Yeah, um, yeah, sure. Um, I think, I mean, I think this is, um, it's a really great step, this paper, and to, to have all this um, kind of knowledge kind of combined in this paper. And I think we all seen that there's still a lot to do. I mean, um, and um, so thanks for Thomas pointing out that, that Fibri is open for any support in doing this, because what we aim to uh, to achieve, and that together with Oxford and CBRV, is to um, have on some level, um, maybe not in, in, in the same depth we have in this paper, but some information on international level, like across countries, across the globe, um, to really understand where is tokenization actually going and what, what does it mean in different legal legislations to, to have a tokenized property or to use tokens in general. And that is something which we, we aim for in, in the next, in the following up five uh, industry report to make it more transparent to everybody to understand what's actually going on. And that I think is a very basic uh, step in order for people to um, start adopting the technology and using it in, in their businesses. Okay, excellent, thank you. So uh, to Thomas's point then, after this webinar, we will put out an email to all, to all uh, registered people and, and, and attendees. So on that, uh, we'll include a contact point. So if people want to uh, propose or put forward any uh, additional uh, projects, then, then then they can do that and build that into the database as well. Uh, Andrew, would you like to make any final remarks? Just thank you to all the people who called in and. Um, comments that we've received in, in question form, uh, for example, Magnus telling us about the single property companies on the Swedish Stock Exchange, all of that information is extremely helpful and it will be included in uh, in the next version of whatever we put out. So thank you very much for your participation and yeah. thank you, Akim and Thomas, for your support. Great, thanks. You're more than welcome. Yeah. So just wanted to uh, close off uh, finally uh, by saying that uh, we have uh, a couple of events uh, coming up. Uh, in particular, I want to draw your, draw your attention to the Oxford Real Estate Program, which is a one week executive program uh, for uh, experienced uh, professionals working in real estate and real estate investment. Uh, we have people from investors, we have people from funds, we have people from, from uh, development companies in there, we have lawyers, we have real estate owners. Uh, we typically have 40 to 50 people in, in, in the class. Uh, we're at 39 as we stand at the moment, so we have a, a couple of final places uh, remaining, but we're looking to fill those over the next two weeks. So if you are interested in attending, uh, please uh, raise your hand uh, in, in, in the next two weeks. Uh, any inquiries on that, uh, please contact myself or my contact Abdul. Our details will also be on the, on the email which come through uh, following this webinar and it's it's deliberately a global program and i think we've had people from 65 countries in the first five iteration of the program so it's a, it's very much a global focus that's right uh also to give uh, a plug as well to the oxford real estate society conference uh which will be in the Science business school in oxford uh in february uh so we will also put out details of that uh in in, in the email as well uh if you are uh, local, I guess we have international people on here, but if you are local, it, it would be great to, to have you join us for the day in February. Uh, with that, really, just to say thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Th thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Akeem, for your time and contributions today uh, in doing that. And thank you to everybody who has registered and attended uh, the webinar. Thank you. Have a good afternoon.